When people say they go to church to get entertained or for every other reason but not to learn the Word of God, how are you going to fight the devil if you don't know what this book says? Because the one who is in charge, who basically set the faith, is telling us how to maneuver around these types of evil. You know, I was thinking about this. I think that in this current climate, uh, what we're seeing from the world is definitely, for sure, a departure from God. Um, definitely evil. Okay, I've been talking about this for many weeks now. If you look at what's happened to our educational system, what's happened to our justice system. I mean, just across the board, it seems like we are a people that are being exposed to so much evil that it's, it's a little bit mind-boggling if you st stop to think about it. How do we actually prepare ourselves for encountering evil? And it's very hard to tell if you think about it well, some people say, well, you know evil when you see it. But if you take it from the Bible and you start looking at evil in the Bible, it's actually quite subtle. And that's why I decided I would go into the book and I would find examples that maybe would not be the things you would look for, but these are important in the times we're living in. And the, the examples, I think, will help us tremendously. In Luke's writing alone, Luke catalogs four events or instances that in involve some type of, we'll call it a magic or um, some type of evil spirit. So for example, there is a passage in the book of Acts, Acts 8. There is a man going around town who they said is, possesses the great this man is the great power of God. That's verse 10, Acts 8, verse 10. But who is this man? Well, if you go back and you start reading, uh, Philip, verse 5, went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame, were healed. And there was great joy in that city. There was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery, and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard because of the long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also, and he was baptized. So it's kind of interesting that Luke paints this scenario almost as a battle of two goods, but not really. Simon, Simon is actually bewitching the people in times past. Of course, he gets saved. Verse 13 says that. He's also believed himself, was baptized. He continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now, what's interesting is this same Simon saw that through the laying uh, of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. Okay, give me some, you know, give me the power, I'll, I'll pay you. So there's one note to self right there. Uh, even though Simon was saved, he still had some, we'll call it evil juju, because he basically wants to buy the power of the Holy Spirit so that he can do wonders and he can do the things that Philip has done. So don't always think somebody got saved and all of a sudden they're a saint. <laughs> don't think so, right? So you have that. And it's very interesting also that 
the same man that it says of him, he bewitched the people, he hears the preaching and he gets saved. So there's a couple of things here. Now, obviously, Luke doesn't go into detail. I believe Luke wrote this portion, doesn't go into detail. But if you've got a margin somewhere, just put a footnote. People who think they can manipulate God. That's actually your first evil to look out for. And there are a lot of those people in ministry. A lot. So if you remember, it was Peter that called him out and said, the only way out of this game for you, Simon, is to repent, even though, remember, he'd been saved. But he gets called out by Peter. Uh, Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. So there's the other thing to look out for in this day and age, not just people who think they can manipulate God or the Holy Spirit, but this man still thought that his money was good to also manipulate God and the things of God. So there's another one. Now, I constantly see this a lot with preachers on TV, telling the people if they'll sow a seed here and they'll get this much back or whatever. It's all manipulation. No one can make those promises. Not a soul can make a promise like that. And God never, in his book, never guarantees. In fact, pretty much you have a guarantee that if you follow God, everything will hit your fan and then some, okay? <laughs> and the chances of you getting incredibly blessed, not that they're bad, but if that's what you came into the kingdom for, you might be in the wrong place. Just think about that. All right, then there's another event, uh, a, named, a person named Elemas, who Paul encountered on Cyprus at the start of his first missionary journey. Now, the Apostle Paul thinks this man Elemas is under the control of the devil, and he turns to him and says, you are a child of the devil, an enemy of everything that's right. You are full of every kind of trickery and deceit. Paul predicted this would end badly for Elemas, and it did. He forewarned him he would lose his sight. He did. Now, let me just stop there for a second. Paul says, you're a child of the devil, an enemy of everything that's right. I'm going to ask you a question. Are you afraid to say that to somebody who is blatantly doing evil? Because I'm not. He says, you're an enemy of everything that is right. Now you tell me, I'm not saying that we're living as Puritans here, but you tell me if you can, with good conscience, look at the news cycle today, this day, isolate one day, and tell me that what you are exposed to is not basically the enemy of everything that is right, because that's what you're being exposed to. And people say, well, how could every outlet be evil? They're not. They're given the talking points. And they all have to say the same talking points. I don't care what station you listen to. You're going to hear the same words repeated in different places. You think you watch your local TV station, but that station actually is a subsidiary or a station within this city that has tentacles in another city and you keep moving on, they're not independently generating what they're telling you. It's talking points that all come down. So when people say, well, what do you do with somebody who is an enemy of everything that's right? You seek out the right and you seek to avoid the evil. It doesn't mean you don't watch the news. It means you start looking at what is the intent behind this? See, we no longer, I'm sorry, but we no longer have news reporting. We have agenda detailing. We have editorializing agendas to put in your ears so that you, because people, let's just face it, the machines behind the people think you and I are not smart enough to think for ourselves. So we have to be told what to think. And that comes through mass repetition 
I'm just telling you. This is what Paul said to this man. And I don't think Paul was afraid when he said it. I'm going to ask you again. Is there anybody in the sound of my voice that is afraid to confront the wrong and say you are an enemy of everything that's right? Because I'm not. No, there was a time when I said, be, be diplomatic. But I think that chapter is over. There is no diplomacy. You cannot reason with the devil. You cannot reason with evil spirits or evil forces. So you have one choice. Stand on what is right. And don't get into this, well, how do I know what's right? If you have to have that conversation, you shouldn't even be listening to me. I'm sorry, I'm just going to say that. Now, there's another event that's chronicled in Acts, Acts 16. It's the slave girl with the spirit of divination that follows Paul around and troubled him. This spirit literally is referred to as the Python spirit, able to see or predict the future, which is why some greedy people were around her seeking to exploit her supernatural gift. Paul believed this girl was under a demonic spirit or under demonic control, which is why he commanded the spirit within her to come out. So again, kind of interesting, because it says that this spirit followed Paul around and troubled him. This girl, who knows what she was saying to Paul, except, you're men of God, great men of God. Like, what could be wrong with that, right? But, of course, it's almost a little bit what I'd call the spirit of parody. You know, somebody who walks around giving so many compliments and building up the person you have to say, is this a mockery? You ever, has that, anyone ever done that to you, where they're saying something so great to you and you have to turn around, right, <laughs> right? I think this was a little bit, I'm not saying that that's what's Paul, what Paul was trying to say, but sift down to the, to the brass tacks here, and you might kind of have that as a takeaway. There is one more. Let me turn to it. It's in Acts 19, and this one's kind of interesting. Um, in Acts 19, beginning at verse 13. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. There were seven sons of one Siva, a Jew, and a chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped of whom the evil spirit was, leaped on them, overcame them, prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And he's talking about the exorcist Jews, not the people who were possessed. All right? <laughs> That's kind of a strange scenario if you read it or write. Um, so this one, I, I say it's interesting because of the nature of it, but probably the thing that I want to hone in on is it says here, they had an evil spirit in them, seven sons. Now, there are a lot of people, you know, if you, if you say, you, what's coming out of your mouth sounds like an evil spirit. Somebody's going to look at you and go, okay. But have you ever kind of stopped to ask yourself, and this is a little bit of a strange commentary, but have you ever asked yourself why certain people, there are certain people in the news, certain people who are basically fixtures in our life globally, have you ever asked, don't these, are these people not human? Can they not see the evil that they are doing here? Has anybody asked that question at all? Well, here's my point. Maybe they are not capable of seeing the effects they're doing because they are blind. They've been turned over. They are, they believe a delusion, a lie, and they're damned if they ever believed at all. So it's kind of interesting that at least in the writings of Acts, I said there are four of these, and I think they are deliberate, not just in the telling of a story, but in juxtaposing the, the power of God, the power of the gospel, over any other power. And these four play out just like that, that God is greater than any other power, that ultimately he has the power to silence this power, to 
uh, do whatever he wants to do with it. Now, if you go into the Old Testament, you've got a tapestry of words that talk about all kinds of different gods, Baal, Ashtoreth, Molech, mostly referred to, by the way, even though they say the god of, usually they're referred to as idols. Um, Lilith, who is the demon who will inhabit Edom after God's judgment, that is in Isaiah 34. There's all of these, we'll call them sketchy figures or strange happenings, if you will. And this is why Deuteronomy 18, 10 through 12, we read, Let no one be found among you who sacrifices his son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft or casts spells, or who is a medium or spiritist or who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord, and because of these detestable practices, the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you. So think about that. God has said many times over in different places, there's only me, I'm God, there are no other gods. So praying to an idol or worshiping another spirit, God says, no, I, I don't want that. So it's kind of interesting that when you start analyzing even the leadership of, in the Old Testament, of the divided kingdoms, Hoshea, who was the last king of the northern kingdom, who set up sacred stones and Asherah poles and made the people bow down and prostrate themselves um, to what God said was an abomination to him. These are the things that you've got to look at as evil. See, when you start giving way on these things, everything else can, er can be eroded under your feet real quick. You give way on one thing, next thing you know, you'll be giving way on many things. So, you know, this... this passage on Hoshea, and he's not the only one. Many other leaders led the people wrong, led them astray, led them away from God. As a result of this, God's anger was kindled against the people, and they were removed from his presence. That's in 2 Kings. Now, in the Old Testament, we can find several instances of an evil spirit taking control, or at least trying to take control and manipulate. Abimelech sought to rule over a section of the northern kingdom known as Shechem. After all, the citizens seemed to give him their support. He turns around. He's got the support of the entire citizenry. Turns around. He's got 70 brothers. That was a busy mom. <laughs> and murders them all except for one, Jotham. He had the support of the entire populace. That's what he needed. But he was worried that his brothers might take him out, so he took them out first. And if he had 70, that means he took out 69 of them. You tell me what's evil. The person who's willing to, for whatever, no matter what, and whatever I have to do, I will, power hungry, I will take my rightful place. Now, because of what Abimelech did in murdering his 70, 69 brothers, <laughs> makes a difference, one was still alive, um, God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the people of Shechem after he ruled over Israel for three years. Kind of interesting that God maybe poured a little bit more on in torment. The people could have taken him out, by the way, and they didn't. Um, Probably the most famous example of something akin to what I've been talking about is the evil spirit that would come, come upon King Saul. And the only way that this evil spirit would be quieted and go away would be for someone to play the harp, to play music that would calm him and he would come back to his senses. The musical gifts of a young man named David who would eventually be king, but for now just a boy who would be summoned to play a musical instrument when the king would be troubled with this spirit. Now, the Bible says he, Saul would feel better and the evil spirit would leave. But keep in mind this malignant spirit would also have enough rage in it to want to kill David. Okay, so... When I say there was an evil spirit, don't just think that 
Saul was in a foul mood that day. <laughs> it's a little bit more than that. Now, here's another level of something. What happens to a person when they can be opened up like that to be led to do something evil? Now, I, that's a big topic which I can't possibly answer in uh, the next 30 or 40 minutes. But I could say to you, if we keep looking at all these examples, we see that sometimes, whether it's an evil spirit, whether it is something with malicious intent, something that is to do harm, something that is to manipulate, we find the examples and then we try and sift down, how does that look today? And that's what I'm trying to show you. You know, sometimes we read and it's disconnected. That, oh, that happened way back there. But no, it's, it's happening now, all right? Um, so then there's another account of 400 prophets that are inspired by evil to give a false uh, report and advice to King Ahab. The king had sought to find out whether or not he should attempt to reclaim a city that was once his, now occupied by his enemies. The passage that I'm referring to is in 1 Kings 22, and it suggests evil spirits are trying to lure Ahab into attacking the city. And by the way, it worked. Uh, one of the spirits goes out and says, quote, a lying spirit, that there will be a lying spirit in the mouths of all of his prophets. And this actually happened with God's permission. So not everything that's evil happens at the behest of the devil. This actually happened with God's stamp of approval on it. And why? Because God did not want him attacking that city. He ends up losing his life. So we have enough in the Bible to show how sometimes people can either be manipulated, lured, the perception, the thought process. Uh, in fact, if you go all the way back to the beginning, the serpent of the garden who is addressed at different times, including right up to the end in the book of Revelation, again and again depicted as the tempter, deceiver, liar, manipulator. So it's, it's pretty plain to see that combing the examples, we have kind of keep sifting. You're going to come, come down with maybe about six or seven bullet points to look at what exactly, if I'm trying to isolate evil that's going on, it's not so much maybe the initial act, but what may be behind the act. If you read Ezekiel 28, if you read Isaiah 14, you have enough details about the devil, the usurper. The book of Job, for example, gives us Satan is both accuser and afflictor. Job's wealth and his health are gone. His wife turns against him. His children are killed, yet Job responds positively towards God, not his friends, but towards God. Um, the, the lesson of that book, by the way, should be probably the lesson of this message, but it's not. That means no matter what's going on, no matter what state you find yourself in, no matter what's coming at you, um, it's almost as though that book is trying to tell us, don't start complaining or changing what you were saying about God when things go bad, that's part of what we say, the rain falling on the just and the unjust alike. Um, but in that book, even there it says in the book of Job, it talks about God giving permission to the devil. Have you considered my servant Job? So when we're trying to peel back the layers of what, what we label as evil, malicious spirits, not finger-pointing with rumors and uh, things that we just say there's no substance to it, but the substance of things that we are dealing with every single day as Americans. And if you think that the devil is to be feared, God is saying, look at my power, it's much greater. And this is the thing that actually, as I was preparing for this message, it kind of registered with me. If you think about it, you cannot overcome the ills that surround you until you are looking to Christ. So there, as I said, are enough examples. We could go down the pathway of one that 
has been a favorite of mine in this respect. Zechariah 3 talks about the vision of the high priest who's got dirty garments on, and Satan is there to accuse. And I love what God says, take the dirty garments off of him and clothe him with festive garments. In other words, the accuser, the usurper, the man manipulator is always there to try and bring doubt and cast doubt, fear, questioning God. Now, I don't, there's no reason why you and I shouldn't ask questions of God, but questioning God, that's his design. So that, for example, that evil is one that is designed to get into your ear. Maybe you're not good enough. Maybe you've been too bad. Maybe you haven't done everything that needs to be done for you to have relief in your soul and find forgiveness from God. Whatever that is, the picture that's painted should resonate within the heart of every believer that the devil, Satan, or his minions are always out there to accuse, manipulate, instill doubt, fear. Uh, it's, it's all the regular, usual things. And of course, the writer of First Chronicles said, Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to take a census of Israel. That's First Chronicles 21. So even something that sounds like David should have done, well, the instructions from God were that he should not. But Satan stirred up his spirit. So let me paint this one as an interesting way to look at evil. Sometimes good people... David was a man after God's own heart, can be manipulated, incited, moved to do the devil's bidding. Have you ever had someone, and I'm talking about believers now, they know the book, they know how to give a word of comfort, and yet instead of telling you something out of the book that might give you the comfort that you need, they become almost like the devil's uh, buddy doing his bidding and seem to kind of ask you, well, did you bring this on yourself? And what did you do next? And they're more interested in making you feel worse and bringing you down than they are lifting you up and helping you get out of the pit. So there are enough of these, as I said, examples. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Satan makes his first appearance as the supernatural tempter of Jesus. What I find interesting is nowhere do we read that somehow Jesus was surprised at Satan's appearing. So why are we? I'm, I'm, I'm like only hearing about three people going, yeah, okay. Jesus was not moved by Satan's appearing and tempting him three times. So why are we moved? Why do we go nutty? And sometimes we can't even see that the devil is doing something. The devil is using us or abusing our goodness. I'm just saying, these are things to consider. Jesus is led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted, and that's after he was fasting for many days. So, so now, most of us, if you be fasting that long, what are you thinking of? Oh, I'm so hungry. Mm. Oh, yeah, I could go eat the bark of that tree. I'm so hungry, right? It's not like they had a drive through right there and wherever he was. So the devil's first drive here is to take what the devil perceives is Jesus in a weakened state and tempt him. So how can he tempt him? By misusing his powers to satisfy his hunger, break his fast by using his powers to obtain food. There's several categories in here. And to all this, of course, Jesus responds, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The second event in this temptation has to do with pride or even one's potential to become power hungry. Remember, again, a test to see if Jesus would keep fidelity to the Father. I, I find this kind of funny. In fact, it probably won't make sense for people who are not familiar with this. But there is something in here that I just find kind of, I think, interesting. I'll read it from Matthew 4. Uh, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them 
and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee. That almost makes me laugh. He's telling that to the one who made everything. Isn't that rich? Like somebody saying, hey, they just pickpocketed you. They took 10 bucks out of your pocket and turned around and said, I'm going to give you a gift today. Do you feel lucky? I'm going to give you 10 bucks. Wasn't yours in the first place. So again, usurper, liar, con artist, you name it. Okay? And of course, failing miserably to get Jesus to do any of his persuasions, the devil will leave Jesus for a time. I find it noteworthy. This, this is kind of noteworthy. His responses, Jesus' responses, are all essentially out of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 8 to be precise, and they are straightforward pushback. You know, the devil basically, you know, think of it this way. Command these stones to be made bread. And he answers, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then he says to him, cast yourself down. Um, he says, it is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And then, of course, the last one, he says, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. So it's kind of interesting that right there in this pattern, Jesus is not saying, go get out your special stun gun, because that's the way you fight the devil. Or get out your worst jokes, the devil will leave. He says, this is how you fight the devil, the word of God. So when people, I want you to listen to me, because this, this is a really big thing for me. When people say they go to church to get entertained or for every other reason, but not to learn the word of God, how are you going to fight the devil if you don't know what this book says? Because the one who is in charge, who basically set the faith, is telling us how to maneuver around these types of evil. Straight out of the mouth of the evil one, you don't try and discuss this in a rational, well, listen here, Satan, how long have we known each other? <laughs> Read what's right there. And then I want you to think about the last time, not What's ahead? I want you to think about the last time you dealt with something that had evil or demonic activity to it. And did you, was your first thing to think of, there is a scripture, there is a sword of the Lord, the word of God, that I am able to slice through the evil that is confronting me. Now, that's not going to work if some guy's out there trying to uh, steal your car. All right? And says, get out or I'm going to kill you. And, and the word of the Lord said, <laughs> no, never mind. But I'm talking about the things that basically sometimes we have trouble discerning what is and what isn't. And there is your example right there. Now, Paul will, will pick this up and expound upon it even more in Ephesians 6. But the answer is right there. So how do we as a godless country, or we look very godless right now, how do we even push back on the evil when the people that are trying to push back have no equipment to push back? And some of you are looking at me like, and that's what I came to church for? Absolutely. Because that's what you come to church for every single week, whether you know it or not. And I'm probably talking to people who don't know it. But as a pastor, I can tell you, it is so darn frustrating to me. I remember I had a friend of mine who's got a couple of young kids, and she's just the most delightful person I've ever met. But she started talking to me about potentially, yeah, I think I might start going to church, you know. And, of course, I heard a couple of weeks later that they found a really good church. The first thing out of her mouth, they have a great uh, child care and great entertainment. The church has just this amazing music department. It was so entertaining. I enjoyed the music service. That's all great. I'm not saying that's a sin or that's bad. But if the first thing out of your mouth isn't, wow, I learned a lot today, you're probably not in the right place. 
And th what I'm showing you today proves this more than anything. You cannot fight this fight in the flesh. You cannot fight this with weapons made from man's uh, or humankind's machinations. It has to be fought in the spirit by the word of God. And if you keep reading, there's something very interesting also. Um, many times we encounter Jesus casting out devils or evil spirits. For example, in Luke's writing, we catch up with Jesus soon after he preached at the synagogue at Nazareth. He casts out a devil from a man that was at the synagogue in Capernaum. Now, Jesus healed many people from their demonic afflictions, and yet the religious leaders accused him of being under the control of Beelzebub. In other words, the people who will come at you and point the finger are usually not even able themselves because they don't know the word of God. They are not able to distinguish between what is Beelzebub, what is the devil, what is, who is Satan, who is the liar, who is the usurper, who is he versus who is God. And because they cannot discern between the two, eh, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, that's pretty much, uh, how, how can Beelzebub cast out demons in the spirit of Beelzebub? So again, it's trying to see underneath us all these religious leaders accusing him. Their greatest sin, in my opinion, they didn't, there was no New Testament. They didn't know the Old Testament. They could not have known the word of God. They could not have known the word of God. That, to me, is criminal. So you are essentially given the position by God, but you don't know anything of the word of God because they would have known multiple times over, just by a few things that Moses said, a prophet greater than myself is coming. There's so many different things that point to Christ, they would have seen this and said, no brainer. But instead, they accused him of being under the control of Beelzebub. Jesus' response, no one can enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man, then he can rob his house. Now, this is rhetorical, so please don't answer this. I'm curious to know how many people have read this and think that the strong man's house is speaking of God or speaking of the devil. Go back and read that and put some thought into that, reading that passage, and you might find that the answer is right there in front of you. We tend to kind of blur it up. I'll let you figure that one out. But the entire passage is about the power of God over the devil. So if you think about that. John refers to Satan as the prince of this world three times. John 12, 31, John 14, 30, and John 16, 11. And in the first epistle, he, in his first epistle, crystallizes the whole thought by stating the following. We know that we are the children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. John, writing, let's say, before the year 100, says, we know we're the children of God, but the whole world is under the control of the evil one. So you still have Christians out there saying, oh no, Jesus dealt with Satan, and it's all finished. Well, if it's all finished, why, why do we have to wait until the end of the book for Satan to be bound? Hello. Okay, never mind. <laughs> I'm just... I, my job is to poke holes in all the stupidity that's out there so that we can actually become thinking people again. In the parable of the weeds, the weeds are the sons of the evil one. The weeds were sown by the devil. They will grow alongside the wheat, the children of God, until the end when the weed is separated from the chaff. Just tell me this then, because we know evil is always going to be around us. It exists and will exist until the end. So the question that needs to really be understood or, or pondered, if you will, is to say, is it, is it that easy or that blatant to use discernment to sort out the things that are evil and make a distinction between those things that you see as inherently evil versus those things that you could just say, well, it, it's something about the surface of an evil person, but not inherently evil in of itself. Does that make sense? Something that's so blatantly over the top versus something that is just superficial. The person themselves is not, but they may be under the control of the devil or other forces to do their bidding. I'd like to say 
it seems to me almost impossible, and I go back to this because it's the, it, it's the biggest one that I can think of. How is it possible that so many people, and I'm not talking red or blue, just take the whole government and put it in a big circle. How is it possible that so many of these people just are just turning a blind eye to blatant evil as though there's nothing to see, we don't want to talk about it. Though there's a handful of people that are, are talking about things, but they are, their version of talking about it is going. We might hear a little peep, but that's it. And let me just say this to you. We're going to find that there has been such a horrific, disgusting evil committed against our children in this land, not just the indoctrinations in schools, but the amount, it's all starting to come together for me, the amount of missing children, the amount of abducted, the amount of, you just, the list keeps going on and somehow these children are reappearing in other parts of the country or the world, tells you that there's a lot, there's a lot of evil that has gripped this country. Our nation is in the grip of that. And the only way to push back, you would say, oh, are, you, are you saying I should quote scripture to everybody? No. I'm talking about the things that do confront us, just like Jesus did. But I'm also telling you that there's a time and place, and staying quiet is no longer an option. You know, somebody might say, well, what are you trying to say? I'm trying to say to you that when you see evil, you've got to call it out. It's, it's just as bad. Think about it. There are people trying to actually call out real evil that are being silenced. And that's what I'm saying to you. If you it's almost like being in a room that you can't get out of, there's no way to get out of it. Well, trust me, if you're really trapped, you're going to start trying to break the glass, the doors, the mirrors, whatever's around you, to get out of there, to free yourself. That is the responsibility we have right now, and I'm just using one, for the children of this country. They cannot help themselves. And responsible people who actually care about humankind have a responsibility to talk about this evil and to make sure that enough people are hearing this and you don't just discount and say, no, it's not happening in my school, it's not happening in my backyard, it's not happening here. This may be the child uh, prostitution and trafficking capital of the world right here, California. You say, oh, I can't believe that. Well, I do. And, and based on a lot of facts, not opinion, based on a lot of facts that we're seeing, there's so much evil here that if people are not willing to open their mouth to protect a child, then where are we at in this world? But there are just so many people that just see the evil and just, just keep your head down and keep moving. And that's, I'm sorry to tell you, but that's not how you fight evil either. So let me give you seven bullet points. And they're just that from everything that I've gone through that should be, we'll call them, they're more than red flags. And if you look for them, you will see them. You'll pay attention to them. The first one is people acting like they can control or manipulate God. That equally goes, by the way, for people who are so hell-bent to play God to change our climate. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, I feel sorry for you. That's number one. Number two, spirits that are sent to trouble the believer. People who lead others away from the truth. That's happening on a rampant, huge scale in this country, and not just about religion. We're not talking just about that. We're talking overall. Listen, the biological question, I love this, you interview all of these highly degreed people and they cannot tell you what a biological woman is. You know what the evil is? The evil is thinking somehow that you can play God and decide how this design can be redesigned and repurposed for something else which it never had a purpose for. A man cannot breastfeed a child. All it can do, you can go to your doctor and your doctor will give you tons of chemicals to make you maybe possibly lactate and poison the child before it possibly has a chance at life. Now listen, in the sound of my voice, if there's anybody that feels like they were born to be something else, go for it. 
Go and live your life as happy as you can be. Just stay away from our children and stay away from making it my issue that I have an issue with. I wasn't always a Bible person. I wasn't always a God-fearing person. But I can tell you, when you come to the truth, you can't look at a lie or a half-truth and go, yeah, that's plausible. That, that could work for me. No, it could never work. Not in a million years. So people who lead others away from the truth, there's another evil for you. Spreading lies and propagating things that are not true at all. Now, if we were going to talk about leading people away from the truth, speaking of the church, oh, the media did that for us and the government by, now I'm not saying the church doesn't have any culpability in this because it does. The church has culpability. Let me start there first because the church decided somehow it didn't need to stay by the stuff. Let's expand and have different, different reasons for being instead of the main one, Jesus Christ, okay? But if you go through all these, you, you begin to realize that being led away from the truth is harmful, whether it's in God's book, whatever it is, you're being led away from the light into darkness. Now, we, we are people who were once in dark and now walk in the light. So you tell me how that all works. It's evil. Um, fourth on my list are spirits that are oppressive. I've talked about all the examples I've given you. This one is kind of interesting. It's the spirit that comes upon a Christian, a believer, takes out all your joy, makes you depressed, makes you down, makes you feel weak, makes you feel sick. And by the way, being sick isn't evil in and of itself. There is no evil there. But an oppressive spirit that can come on the believer has the ability to basically make you not able to function. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah, okay, so I'm not crazy. Um, I think this one ties in with maybe one or two others, but the spirit, spirits that are accusatory with regard to only what God can do. So a little bit like the devil telling Jesus, throw yourself down. There are a lot of people out there trying to direct you with misinformation or disinformation. The first place you have got to, you're not sure what to do, stand still, quit moving. That's my advice to you. Somebody says, well, I, I didn't know what to do when these things were happening in my life and I just had to make a decision. If you didn't know what to do and you made a decision that's life-changing on pressure from somebody else, you're the one with the problem. I want you to think about that. Don't blame God and don't blame the devil. Six and seven go together. The twisting of scripture. And by that I mean, if you want to take it all the way to the nth degree, the twisting of scripture is to tell people, for example, that this book is not all inclusive. Or the twisting of scripture, did God really say? That's the voice of the devil from the garden that's still talking today, using colored flags and trying to get people to say, you've been excluded. Using skin color, you've been ex excluded using whatever state you came in that door as an excuse when the fact is when it says whosoever will it means the door is wide open and if you are not walking through it it is your problem not God he opened the door for you and the misuse of scripture so when people say uh, the pastor was reading Romans 1 I told you this story before. I, I used to go and work in the jails and the prisons. And we had one chaplain who was hung up on fornication. Uh, you, you know who I'm talking about, OK? And uh, we're going to have a meeting with all of the men from this unit to talk about fornication. Now, you see, that's what I'm talking about, misuse of scripture. So this pervert, who by the way was only made known to me after the fact, who was uh, working the sex offenders unit, which was the unit that I was placed in without telling me, um, made sure that his gatherings 
were to talk about fornication, not to wash your mind with the word of God, not to pray, not to know God more, not to build a better relationship so you can change your way of thinking and change, and God can then help you to change your life. No, we're going to talk about fornication because this pervert was so perverted that he liked misusing the scripture to talk about things under the guise of talking about things of God, to have conversations with individuals that actually didn't need to be exposed to that type of conversation. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. It's hard to do all this without saying things, right? <laughs> but I said things, all right. My point is this. There are, I, I'm sure there are more. I wrote down seven that I could think of that are the pure evils that are around us all the time and not being able to recognize them immediately recognize them and then how to deal with them. And dealing with them isn't, listen, there may come a day, and I'm just telling you this because I, I can see it very clear, there may come a day where this country may see civil war again. I could see that. A split right down the middle, a great divide between people who want to be free and people who want to be controlled. I can, I can see it, uh, and amongst other things. Um, if we take just that one example I said, that that's a possibility. But what are people actually going to be fighting for? Are they going to be fighting for protecting their God-given rights? Or are they going to try and be protecting things that the government said, yeah, we give you permission to do that, because I'm going to be fighting for my God-given rights over here. Okay? So somebody tells you, somebody tells you, well, you won't be able to fight. Well, why won't I be able to fight? Because um, you, you gave up the right to carry and bear arms. You gave up the right to your free speech. You gave up many of your rights freely and willingly. That's another evil that I'm talking to you about. Recognize where we're at. I'm trying to give you the biblical roadmap to combat a lot of things that are only going to get more in your face as time goes on. And you have a choice. You can be like the people the individual that just stands there and says, well, I don't know what to do, and I'm, I'm afraid, and I, I can't do anything because I'm just a little ant in the big scheme of things. Or you can be a person that maybe is an ant in stature. You're small. You have a small voice. You have a small footprint in life, but you can take on the biggest and the greatest challenges by saying, I will not back down. I will not back away. I'm not giving up my rights. I'm not giving up my freedom. I'm not succumbing to evil. I'm not listening to the evil that's being pushed at me. Why? Because I recognize it immediately, and I'm able to. I've prepared myself. I am able to rebuke, resist, and tell the devil what I really think. This is not a caricature. This is real and figure out that exactly like the temptation of Christ, now that that line has been drawn, you say, oh, I'll do it, I'll stand up. We'll see, because the devil's also great at making you think you don't have the power to stand up, you don't have the power to be strong, when all that power that comes from God is squandered the minute you believe that lie. So. In the face of everything, what I'm trying to say to you, this message I felt was very needed because there are people who cannot seem to figure out we are on a very bad course for this country and have been. And this, this has nothing to do with, I'll say this for the umpteenth time, this has nothing to do with a singular individual. It has to do with a group of people Start with the top government and work your way down and then put it into your cities and into your streets. And that's why California still has the largest homeless problem because the evil is not that people can't afford housing. The evil is that there's a lucrative business to be made off of homeless people. So why fix the problem when somebody can get more enriched off of the person who's down on their luck? Think about these things because this is affecting where we live and how we live and our quality of life. Yeah, I'd love to go back 15 or 20 years. And, and if there was any way, like that moving freight train, that we could all just kind of keep it from coming down the tracks or even a common phrase today, derail it. Uh, 
Why not? The government uses that freely. Why not? Why not? But my point is, we don't have that. that. That opportunity already passed. The opportunity we have now is to equip ourselves and to learn what scriptures do I need? What are the things? You know, everybody knows what, you know what your weakness is. You should by now. This is where the devil comes. The devil will come as an angel of, the light, of light. The devil will come in when I'm overwhelmed and I've got too much on my plate. The devil will come in when I'm having my worst day. Whatever that is, you know what that is. You figure it out and you start equipping yourself by recognizing the attacks usually are usually are targeted in a specific direction. So if you know what they are, you start planning accordingly. It's like having an emergency kit for your car. Your car breaks down, you've got a, a pump for your tires, you've got some extra parts and tools. This is the extra parts and tools for you to not get duped by the devil down here. Now, you can take what I've said today and just say, yeah, okay, that was another message from Pastor Scott, message number 2000, whatever, okay, and I was there and I did my part. Or you can actually think about today's message in how can I become a better fighter for God? And that doesn't mean you go out on the street and take to the streets and riot and start beating people up. How can I become a stronger, greater warrior for God in these dark and really despicable times? And that is knowing for you personally what the attack's going to be, maybe on a corporate level, you see what the attacks are corporately. I mentioned a few of them. These are the things to become equipped with in verses of scripture, in knowledge, in what's happening so that the one thing that can't happen, evil may still happen, and it will, but you and I cannot be duped. We cannot be deceived. We cannot be misled by somebody saying, oh, this is the truth and this is the right, righteous path. No, that's the path of the devil. And if the path that God leads me on seems at first to be a little strange, or maybe there are not too many people on it, don't think that's the work of the devil. Think that's the work of people who are waiting for the magic pill or the magic wand or the magic deliverance instead of looking to the Savior. Only he is able, by the way, to get us out of this mess. You can say, well, are you just going to sit back and be a praying person? I'm going to sit back, be a praying person, but I'm also going to be a person that speaks out the things that repel and rebuke the devil. I'm tired of walking around thinking, another day is gone in this country. Another battle is lost. How about for the Christians, we band together and another battle is won when somebody says, you're right, this small percentage of society, whatever that percentage is, is not the majority. You realize that? We have the majority, I'm sorry, the minority is driving the majority and telling the majority what to do. That tells me that we have a lot of weak people that need to get some backbone, the word of God, and be equipped. And once you do that, trust me, you may not be able to go out and be the one-man army. No one's supposed to be, by the way but we can be an amazing army for God. And that means we band together as faithing people, trusting, and not succumbing to the lies of the devil. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.